up our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. All right, lift your voice, church. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive, break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awaken alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God, you have done great things. You'll be faithful forevermore. You will do great things. And I know you will do it again. For your promise is yes and amen. You will do great things. God, you do great things. Oh, hero of heaven. You conquer the grave, you free every captive, and break every chain, oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awaken alive, oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great things. Sing hallelujah, and hallelujah. God above it all, hallelujah, God unshakable, hallelujah, you have done great things, and hallelujah, God above it all, hallelujah, God unshakable, hallelujah, you have done great things. You've done great things. Oh, hero of heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captain, break every chain. Oh, God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awaken alive. Oh, Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh, God. You have done great things. You have done great things. God, you do great things. Let's pray. Father, we, uh, we thank you for this incredible day. We celebrate the great things you have done. And we think of that line, we dance in your freedom. Today is a day of freedom. The resurrection of Jesus means freedom. We praise you for the freedom over this church. We praise you for the freedom that we walk in. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Amen. You can grab your seats just for a moment. Just want to say a very warm welcome to all of you and uh, welcome to Easter Sunday. My name is Caleb, I'm one of the members here at JICC. Um, if you're out of town or if you're a visitor in our church, really a very, very warm welcome to you. Um, we're a church family that loves hosting uh, visitors in our house, and so please do feel uh, warmly welcomed um, and make yourself at home. Um, we really hope you feel encouraged today by what we believe in, and the message that we live by. Today we are celebrating um, an incredible thing, the resurrection of Jesus. And we celebrate um, this resurrection as the culmination of God's redeeming work. 
And so today we're going to worship with songs in a moment. We're going to celebrate the resurrection through testimonies that you'll hear through the service. We're going to remind each other what God has done through His Word. And then finally, we're going to respond in communion as we celebrate with gratitude. So I want to invite uh, Jonathan up. Um, he's going to share a story of restored faith. Um, and uh, after him, we uh, will get singing again. But this is uh, Jonathan Jennings, and he's going to share his story. He's a good friend, and um, yeah, it's a powerful testimony. Over to you, brother. Thank you. Good morning, church. My name is Jonathan. You may know my better half, Sadie, and my parents, uh, Steve and Gail. Thank you. Um, I come before you today to share some of the hurdles in my life over the last few years and specifically the last few months. As a short backstory, in December of 2018, I suffered from a large blood clot in my subclavian vein in my right side. In January of 2019, I had to have a major surgery to prevent that from happening again. In May of 2020, it all happened again, this time on my left side. 2021 was looking up. There were no surgeries that year, but I did meet the love of my life and married Sadie. In 2022, I had a few other surgeries, and they set me back for various few things. I reached my max out of pocket almost each and every year with medical insurance. I was physically, mentally, and financially tired. I am thankful now, but I surely wasn't then. Honestly, I can't recall thanking my God for getting me through any of it. Actually, I think the only time I prayed was being rolled down to the operating room. It was a time in my life when I was far from God, doubtful in the power of prayer, and even more ungrateful because of my circumstances. Once the dust settled, even after a life-changing move across the country, life felt normal for once. I was settling in, focusing on me, However, I rarely attended church and barely believed in prayer, even after everything in my life seemed to finally fall into place. In September of last year, I was rocked by an incident that left me with a traumatic macular hole in my right eye, rendering my central vision completely gone. I was then again back in the thick of it all. More medical bills, more physical pain. I visited many highly recommended doctors who said the only way to restore my vision was through more surgical intervention. It was at this point I was desperately looking for answers that I stepped out of my comfort zone and went to prayer night here at JICC, something I never would have done in years past. Jackie and a few others prayed for me that night. And the presence of God was so abundant that it gave me a glimmer of hope. This is when I started noticing the peace and joy of those in the body of Christ. I took another step in this direction by attending the church receipt retreat, something else I would have never done before. And it was that night a lovely couple, Julie and Kondwani, prayed a prayer of victory over me that night, that my vision would be restored. And in that moment, I finally felt strength in my weakness. A few weeks later, I met with one final doctor for an opinion, and he gave me a diagnosis that with topical steroids, my eye could heal on its own. I was so afraid of another surgery that for the first time in years, I truly stepped forward in faith and trusted that God could heal my eye and restore my vision. Months of being on the steroid helped to some degree, but at the cost of high pressure in my right eye. The doctor then pulled me off the steroid to prevent the long-term damage and or glaucoma, and I thought all hope was lost because the steroid was being withdrawn. I thought that was the way I was healing. I was proven wrong. Mind you, my vision was 2400 at the start of this. I was steady for a while at 2100, and after coming off the steroid, I am now at 2060. And in the last eight weeks, we have had continued improvement from each scan, even without the steroids. God has shown his faithfulness. The images behind me contradict what almost every doctor said was possible. On the left is my macula with a bridged gap where my vision was gone. On the right is a closure of that macula. That was... That gap was, I was told, to only be closed by surgical intervention. Wow. 
I stand before you today with confidence that our God is a healer and he is faithful, merciful, and all-powerful. My vision is not yet fully restored and I'm still in the process of complete healing. But honestly, I'm seeing life more clearly than I ever have before. I truly want to thank all of you in this church, the prayer team, and those of you in my home group that have been and are still continuing to pray for me during this healing process. The journey isn't over yet, and there's still healing to be done, but my faith has been restored in this process. I now crave to be involved in the church and pursue a relationship with my Savior. For the first time in my life, my hope is truly in the Lord, and I can honestly tell you that the peace of God truly transcends all understanding. And finally, my message is for those of you that are tired, that are exhausted, and are running on empty. I encourage you to receive prayer and trust that Jesus is working in your life. God is working through this church and this prayer team is filled with the Holy Spirit. I encourage you to truly lean in and receive prayer because God is so faithful each and every day and he loves you more than you could imagine. As I have been told my whole life, God is good all the time and all the time God is good. Amen. Can I invite you to stand with me? Incredible story of God doing great things. And I, I want to actually inv invite Mercy to come up. And Mercy is going to read Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 to 8. And as she does, I want you to reflect on this, these four verses and the great things that are described as she reads. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. Thanks, Mercy. I invite you this morning to put your efforts aside. I invite you this morning to put your self-analysis aside. I invite you this morning to put your good deeds aside. Put your self-justifications aside. Put your sin aside. Put your shame aside and stand in Christ. Ephesians 2 verses 8, it is by grace you've been saved. This is not of your own doing. It is a gift of God. Receive that gift this morning. Let's worship together.
and just share a brief story with you. Um, a few weeks ago in prayer, just someone from the church had a sense that there was just somebody in the, in the uh, congregation, just somebody in the gathering that was contemplating taking their life. And Rachel came up and said, I want, if somebody comes up, I want to share my story with them. And so we've already heard a story of blind eyes being opened and just want you to hear a story of Rachel going from death to life. And then we're going to continue to sing together. Good morning. Um, my name is Rachel Schwartz, and I would like to share a portion of my story with you. Um, I was born again sometime between 10 to 11 years of age while listening to a song about Jesus. <laughs> I cried, and in his presence, I felt loved and safe. Fast forward to 12, when my father passed away from a thoracic aortic dissection. 
that left my mom with me and my eight siblings. As I'm sure you can imagine, my mom's plate was full taking care of us as well as trying to process her own grief. This led to me having to navigate the grief of losing my father as well as my teenage years seemingly alone. I remember everything feeling dark and scary. I don't remember when exactly the self-harm and intrusive thoughts began. But they were awful and it filled me with such fear. I would see demons in my dreams and sometimes it felt like they were right there with me. Sorry guys, I know I just have to do this. <laughs> I never wanted to end it all, but the darkness was so heavy and the thoughts were so intense that I was afraid that I would. I was also too afraid to tell anyone for fear of being rejected. After a couple years of this darkness that felt never ending, I shared with a youth leader at a youth evening. They took me seriously and prayed for me, not once making me feel rejected, only loved and cared for. That broke something off of me, and I wasn't so afraid anymore. I know it didn't stop completely, but there was some relief. The enemy loses so much power when we share our struggles. Not long after, I was with my brother visiting a friend of his. We all went to a service at his church, and afterward his friend said that he believed he had a word for me. He said, you are not going to die. You are going to live. I had never shared with either of them the things that I was experiencing. I took that word as a truth from God, and in the upcoming days and weeks when those intrusive thoughts came up or the darkness felt like too much to bear, I would tell my heart over and over again, Rachel, God said that you were not going to die. You are going to live. Bit by bit, those thoughts in the darkness faded away. It wasn't overnight, but at one point I realized that they weren't there anymore. The word spoke directly in opposition to the lie that I believed. That I was alone, rejected, and that no one cared. I didn't know it then, but the Lord was teaching me to follow Romans 12 too. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. He has done it so with so many other things in my life. Like David in the Psalms, telling his soul to glorify God. That was me telling my soul about the goodness and the truth of God, even when it felt like darkness was everywhere. Even now, he is so faithful and patient with me, showing me when I have exchanged his truth for a lie. For some people, their deliverance and healing comes immediately and all at once. But for me, it has been promise by promise. He is so good. If there's anyone here that's experiencing this, please reach out. There's so many people here that would love to pray for you. I have found hope and peace and safety in Jesus, and the good news is, is that you can too. Let's stand up together. And we're going to continue to sing about Christ being our cornerstone. Just declare together the weak made strong in the Savior's love.
shall come what a day and when he shall come is just to close your eyes for a moment. I I don't want to rush on from this moment and I, I just have a sense that there's just some of us that need to respond to everything we've heard and, and just sung about. One of the lines in that song read this. It said, I dare not trust the sweetest frame but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Another line said, dressed in His righteousness alone and with our eyes closed, I want to just invite you to respond in a very simple way. If, if you feel like you've in any way trusted in anything else but Jesus, maybe it's today, maybe it was this week, maybe it's a season of your life where you're trying to understand the, the free gift of grace. If, if you feel like, if you're honest, you're not just dressed in Christ's righteousness, but you're trying to dress yourself in in other things too, whatever that may be. With our eyes closed, if that's you, can I invite you just to raise your hand, not not for me actually, but just as a response to God, to say, God, I want to trust in you again alone. I want to trust in your righteousness again alone. I need your help again today. Just raise your hand as as you reach out to God. That's between you and God. See many hands up. Holy Spirit, this is only a work that you can do. Nothing I say up front here can bring a sense, an overwhelming sense of the free gift of grace that is ours to receive. And so, Holy Spirit, with those hands raised, I pray, come and fill the hearts of your children with the free gift of grace. I declare over you the Word of God. This is not of your own doing. Your salvation and the love of God has not been earned by you. It is not of your own doing. It is a free gift of God. Receive the grace, I pray over you. Receive the grace from Jesus. He doesn't want your earnings. He doesn't want your deeds. He doesn't want your justifications. All He wants is your heart. Let's just stay in this place. Second group of people I, I felt was this, anyone that feels just a sense of darkness in their life this morning. Maybe 
something of the testimony has resonated with you. Maybe you've been, been experiencing incredible amounts of medical challenges or you've experienced what Rachel was sharing about. Or maybe there's something else, addiction, struggles. Maybe there's just a sense of darkness in your life and you've not told anyone. You've just been carrying that with you. This is Resurrection Sunday. <laughs> Jesus knows. Jesus cares. Jesus loves you. If that's you, I'm going to ask you to be brave and also just raise your hand if that's you. If there's any sense of just you are needing the light of Christ to shine into your heart, would you mind raising your hand now as you reach out to God? And Father, for the hands that are being raised, even as I pray, let your light shine in the darkness. Let your love be filled where there was anger, where there was self-hatred, where there was hopelessness, bring hope, where, there was, where there's restlessness, bring peace. With those hands raised, anyone experiencing darkness, we are asking you as children for a supernatural miracle, for light to enter those situations and for testimonies. Uh, Jackie was just praying before the service, asking for miracles to come out of the testimonies. We pray for miracles to come out of these stories of, dark, of these stories of darkness. Thank you that we gather this morning not as a people who are good and perfect. We gather as an imperfect people who have been saved. An imperfect people who have been rescued. The ground at the foot of the cross is level and we're all on it. And we thank you for that truth. Bring your light. I pray that you would continue to speak to us. Thank you for the fact, God, that you, you speak to us all the time and you have already this morning. We trust you to do, to do that as we continue. Amen. Amen. Okay, so um, you all can grab your seats. For those with kids, um, you guys can go ahead and uh, check your kids in um, for kids is k5 all the way through fifth grade and actually my mistake as everyone's headed out we're going to greet each other so you can stand up again i'm just getting you warmed up and i just want to mention because we forgot to mention the communion is happening at the end so make sure you grab your communion elements while you greet each other because you'll need them later
Yes, um, you're going to watch a quick one minute video about the women's retreat that is coming up. So uh, turn your eyes to the screen and uh, I'll be back up after that. God has a story in us. He's saved us. He's reconciled us. He's brought in life to us. And so what would it look like if we were a womanhood that had the dust shaken off of us and our stories were able to be read and seen and heard and we would testify to the kingdom of God within us? But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Okay, so just uh, two quick things I wanted to mention. Uh, one was that video. Uh, there's a women's retreat happening, and I brought up a bulletin here. I'm kind of holding it up in a very awkward way, but in this bulletin, there is a QR code that you can scan to register for that women's retreat that's happening in April. Details are on the screen there behind me. Um, it's a two-day event, and I really just want to take a special mention. If you're new to JICC, you're visiting, um, or you want to connect with more people, um, this is a great opportunity to do that, ladies. So I really do want to encourage you to, to jump on that. Uh, the second thing I just wanted to mention is that next Sunday, Sunday the 7th of April, we are going to have a, a really quick but sweet visitor's lunch. Um, and I say sweet in the most positive sense of that word. There will be sweets um, and there will be good lunch. And so if you consider yourself new to JICC, maybe you're visiting and you'd love to just meet some people and meet some of the leaders um, please do uh, consider yourself invited. I don't think you've got an RSVP or register for that. It will happen straight after the service, and I will also speak about it uh, next Sunday and give you more details in terms of where exactly it will happen. Um, so that is happening next Sunday. You're invited, and uh, we hope to see you there if you're new or you're a visitor. I'm going to invite uh, Priscilla up, and Priscilla is going to be reading this morning's text for us. Good morning. Um, today's text is from Matthew 5, verses 1 through 9. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the, is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who are hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Thank you. Amen. We can clap for the word of God. Um. All right, let's pray, and we'll ask the Lord to speak to us through these words. And Lord, we're so thankful to be here today, thankful for the family of God, thankful for your word that is living and active. Uh, it is a word that judges the thoughts and the intentions of our hearts, and so um, we can come in thinking one thing about ourselves and about the world and about life, and your, your word just brings clarity. It brings truth. It shines light into the darkness. And so we pray, Lord, that you would change us today. And we just thank you for the times that we've already experienced through testimony and through song. And we just rejoice in what you have already done. And we pray that as we read and study and are encouraged by your word today, that, that our view, our perspective of you would grow, would be that much more clear. Um, and we would see you for who you are. And we love you. We thank you for this time you've given us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, for those of you who are just joining us, we want to say welcome again. We are in a 
series in the book of Matthew and specifically have been going through different passages on the Sermon on the Mount. And so uh, Priscilla read what, what is called the Beatitudes. She read, she read all of them, but today we're going we're gonna to focus our attention on blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called sons of God, or they will be called children of God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Now, if we were just to do a quick poll on who thinks it's a good idea to be a peacemaker, it would probably get uh, high votes. In fact, it's a phrase that's, that's, that you'll hear in society. In fact, if you were watching the Oscars this year, which is one of the most, you know, it's one of those watched uh, things every year in all the world. And Killian Murphy, who is an Irish actor who won the uh, best actor uh, trophy for his role in Oppenheimer, and uh, it's the role of uh, the man who invented the atomic bomb. And so he gets up and he gives his thanks to all the different uh, people that are there that were part of the movie. And then he gets to the end and he says, like it or not, we live in Oppenheimer's world. We live in this, you know, just, just by saying that, it was the understanding. We live in a world of war. We live in a world of turmoil. And he said, so this award, I dedicate this award to the peacemakers. And as we start and, and we jump into the passage, into these texts of Scripture, I just want us to ask the question, what is that? What does that mean? Certainly, it was something that was said that was good in the moment. It was something that got a lot of applause. Again, there wouldn't be a lot of pushback on wanting to bring peace. But what does it mean? Especially, what does it mean when we know that we're not just experiencing, peace, we're not just experiencing war out there in places like Ukraine or Israel or what's going on now in Haiti, but we understand that even in our, in our own lives, I mean, that was what people were giving testimony about, what, what we were hearing stories about was about challenges in people's lives and marriages that are struggling, people that are dealing with just dark thoughts. So we, we're very well aware <laughs> that we live in a, in a world that is filled with turmoil and into that place, into that world, Jesus speaks these words, blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Three things I want us to just walk through together. One is that we have to have a right view of Jesus. We have to have a right view of ourselves. And then we have to take those two truths and we have to move into a broken world as peacemakers. We have to start with Jesus. Um, the word for peace uh, in the Old Testament scriptures is the word shalom. And the word is so important because the word shalom doesn't just mean the absence of conflict or the absence of war. It actually means the presence of the, the fullness of life, the presence of God, the fullness of who he is. Um, I, for those of you who don't know me, I have, I have uh, five kids, and uh, so they're all very full of life and energy. Um, but I don't know how it's been for you guys lately, but there's been a lot of sickness going around. So I've just heard waves of everybody getting sick. And so we had waves of sickness going through our house. And um, God bless our children. They're very strong-willed. They came from two very strong-willed parents that then came together, and that strong-willedness was multiplied in them. And so when they're feeling those moments of weakness, like they just don't, they're not feeling all that great, then their strong-willedness willedness can even come up all the more and they become determined that they know what is best for them. And here is where we have a little bit of a challenge because there's a way that we can keep the peace by just giving them whatever they want. But it actually isn't something that makes peace for them in the long term, which is giving them the truth and the life that they need to hear that will, that will bring them health. Because we don't want them just to not be sick. We don't want them to just not have viruses. We want them to be filled with life all the time. But it requires that truth come, even truth that's counter what they think, counter what they feel, counter what they want in their life, what they think is going to be best for them. We have to, as loving parents, give them truth. And I want you to just think about that as we focus our time on Jesus, as we start even our time on Jesus, because there can be a way even in our desire to keep the peace and our desire even to make someone feel good about themselves, about where they are, that we actually don't help them move towards shalom, move towards this peace, this fullness of life. And so it was in this chaotic world that Jesus is talked about hundreds of years before he was born in Isaiah chapter 9, 
It says this, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and he shall, his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting P- Father, Prince of Peace, Prince of Shalom, of the increase and of his government and of peace of Shalom. There will be no end. So before even Jesus was born, he was called, he was declared, he was going to be a wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of shalom. He's the prince of peace. When Jesus was born, the angels were singing. They said, glory to God on the highest and on earth, peace among whom, with those in whom he is pleased. And Jesus then taught, and that's the main passage of what we're going to look at in the Sermon on the Mount over these next, not just this week, but in the coming weeks, is really the Sermon on the Mount is, it's really the essence of what it means to be a Christian. It's the essence of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And he's, he's really giving the people, he's giving us what it means to be human, what it actually means to live the life that he has designed us to live and to live that life in a way that's compelling, in a way that, in a way that draws people to himself. But as Jesus was ending his, towards the end of his ministry in Luke chapter 19, he uses this word peace again, but he does it in tears as he looks out over the city and he weeps. It's Luke chapter 19, verse 41. It says, and when he drew near, he saw the city and he wept over it. Would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. But now they are hidden from your eyes. Can we just for a moment stop and see a picture of Jesus as the Savior of the world looking out over people who Scripture describes as harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. And he's weeping over them because they've missed it. In fact, for some of them, for the, for the Jewish people that wanted the Messiah to come, they were living under Roman rule and they wanted a physical Messiah to come and to bring them freedom and life. And so some of the people, the very people that the week before, what we celebrated last week on Palm Sunday, who were waving palm branches, who were, who were saying Hosanna, only he can save, were the very ones a week later saying crucify him. And the way Jesus' life and ministry is described is in a way of one who brings peace. Listen to what it says. He came and he preached peace to you, to those who are far off, and peace to those who are near. See, what the people missed was they wanted the, they wanted the right now. They wanted the physical saving from this oppressive rule that they were under, and Jesus was bringing them a different kingdom. He was bringing them the keys to a different kingdom. It says that he preached peace to those who were far off and those who were near. So I don't know where you find yourself today. I had this great interaction last week with a young couple, and they came up afterwards, and they said, we just want you to pray for us. And I was like, well, what do you you want me to pray for? And they just said, we both separately just feel like God is drawing us to himself. And we don't even know how to describe it to you other than we just— we just know that God is drawing us back to himself. And as people who grew up in the church and had church background, we kind of fallen away. I said, how, how good is it that God, even the week before Easter, not just coming on this Sunday where a lot of times people have maybe been out of the habits of coming and worshiping are here. So you might feel near, maybe things are going well in life and you feel near to God, or you might feel far off and distant from him. The way Jesus' ministry was described is that he preached peace He preached this different kingdom, this new way of living, this shalom to those who are far off and those who are near. And so the first thing is that we have to have our lives centered on Jesus as he is revealed, as he speaks to us. If anything sums up Jesus' ministry, it's this, he is the only way. That was what Jesus was saying. His whole ministry, he was just saying, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The only way for life is through me. And so the first thing is that Jesus, we see Jesus as the Prince of Peace, the Prince of Shalom, the only way to life. The second thing is this, is that we have a right view of self. We see ourselves rightly. And here's where this is challenging, because we often don't see who we really are until we're pressed on, until life presses on us. That was so, so, wasn't that so beautiful about Jonathan's story? 
while talking about just waves of, of sickness. But then, then what happened to his eye, which was a Frisbee golf accident. He's just playing Frisbee golf and gets hit in the face. And his face with this, this horrible diagnosis of blindness and this need for surgery and what, what, it, what it was going to be for him. This stretching, this challenge and this pressing of life that, that then reveals who we really are. It reveals what's really there. And I love, I, we're going to tell a story. I'm going to tell a story in Mark chapter 4. Uh, and I think it's great because we don't really have to draw on all kinds of other stories of other people. We can just talk about the stories of the people in the room and the stories of Jesus and the people who followed him. And we, we could be here all day, all week, just telling stories of, of what God has done. In fact, there's this, there's this line in Mark 4. I always love it because it's, it's a reminder to us that, these, that this was an eyewitness account, that these, these things that are written down in the scriptures are from people who were actually with Jesus and walked with him because it says as Jesus was asleep on the boat that he was asleep on a cushion, which is the detail that is not mentioned. Like the, 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 the literature of this time that is mythical in, in nature, it doesn't have these kinds of details in it. Now, our, our literature today does, but it has this, these kind of detail because it's describing something that really happened from people who were there, who wrote about it and talked about it and passed, passed it down. And so this is Mark's account of this moment where Jesus' disciples are being tested. They're being challenged. It's Mark chapter 4, and we're going to hear Jesus speak peace to this moment. It says, On that day when the evening had come, he said to them, Let's go across to the other side. This is Jesus. And leaving the crowd, they took him and with him in the boat, just as he was, and the other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filled. But he, Jesus, was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. Now, just, we can just stop for a moment. I don't know how you sleep. I'm, I'm a better sleeper than Jackie, so I can fall asleep in like 30 seconds. And she struggles with insomnia at different times in her life. But let's, can we just hold up that when, when we're sleeping well, it's, 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 a, it's a sign that we, don't have, a, that we have, don't have anxiety in our life, that that's one of the things that, that anxious people, it's, that doesn't, it's not a direct correlation. I'm not saying that about Jackie or anybody else that struggles with insomnia. Sorry, that, that came out wrong. Um, <laughs> It's not always a direct correlation, but uh, don't you know that when you're in an anxious place in life, in fact, when I find myself up in the middle of the night and I can't sleep, that it's, it, it can sometimes point to there's something there. There's something, you know, there's something that needs attention. And Jesus is like the ultimate deep sleeper because he's, he's not worried about a thing because they're in the middle of a storm. They're in the middle of these waves. These are fishermen and they're like, afraid for their lives. And Jesus, it, the brother, is asleep on a cushion in the middle of a storm. He's not worried about anything. Again, just these pictures that the, 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 the scriptures give us to paint a picture of who Jesus is, weeping over the city because the people have been blinded. Asleep in the middle of a storm, on the cushion, when they're frantic, he's not worried about a thing. He's at rest. That's why we're linking ourselves to the Prince of Peace this morning. He's asleep on a cushion. And it says the disciples began to cry out. But he was on the stern, asleep in the cushion, and they woke him up and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Can we just, can we connect with the humanity of this story? Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and he rebuked the wind and said to them, said to the sea, peace, be still. And the wind ceased and there was great calm. And he said to them, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, who is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? See, our lives are not just dots on a map. They're not just dots on a timeline. They're highs and lows. They're mountains and valleys. And here's a valley moment. Here's a pressing moment for the disciples. And what comes up in them in this moment where they are, I mean, these are fishermen. So it has, this had to be a pretty bad storm, which is, again, amazing that Jesus is sleeping in the midst of this storm. I mean, these are fishermen. These are people that have been on the water before, and they are afraid for their lives. And what is their natural question that comes up inside of them? 
don't you care? Do you not care about us? Because if you cared, the story would be different right now. That's what's implied behind that. If you cared, the story would be different. And Jesus uses this moment to speak peace to the waves, and they are stilled. They are silenced. And what does it produce in them? It's a moment that produces worship. They look out and they say, they see, who is this even that the wind and the seas obey him? So we think of the problem of ourselves, looking at ourselves for who we really are. We have to recognize that those things that are, when we're pressed on, just like the disciples were in this moment, what is it that comes out of us? Caleb led us in that worship time and said, are we clothed in any other righteousness besides the righteousness of Christ? And that is revealed often in times of testing. The, the, when we think of the word sin, the word sin is described in Scripture. It literally means to miss the mark. And sometimes I've heard it described as kind of like if you think of a, uh, you know, a, a, a marksman and a bow and arrow and, and hitting the center of the target and that only Jesus hit the center of the target, that only God is perfect and holy. But I just recently heard another teaching. I thought, I thought this is actually a better way to describe it. It's just not like missing the mark, like I'm a little off or I'm a few rungs away. The, the, the arrow that I'm shooting in my life doesn't even make the target at all. That all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Maybe it's not for us this moment in the storm. Maybe that wouldn't have drawn it out of us. But there's something that will pull out of us and will cause us to veer our hearts away from God to reveal that we actually aren't loving him with our whole heart. The first commandment is have no other gods before him. So the, of the 10 commandments, the very first one is the reminder that our hearts are to be given over to him in worship alone. And so anything outside of that, anything that is any other loyalty, any other affection that is not him is sin. Again, Jesus is bringing, he's the prince of peace. He's bringing a new kingdom. He's bringing the way that we're to have true life And so what scripture teaches us and reminds us is that we have been justified when we, when we call on Jesus alone to save us, we are justified by faith. And this word justification is, it's a legal term. And Romans 5, listen to what it says. It says Romans 5 verse 1 and 2 says, writing to the people who are uh, believers in Christ, he's writing to the church. He says this, he says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. It's being justified by faith. Then we have peace with God. So what does it look like to have peace with God? It's to be justified by faith. We sang this. I love this refrain. In fact, it just always happens that even when we're putting together the messages and the songs, didn't realize how much they were going to come uh, together. But that we, we sang out loud as a church, praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from the dead. So we have both the idea of a debt being paid and life coming from death. Now, in this time, in this time period, but there's many people who were slaves. And for some of those people, the reason that they were slaves is because they had a debt that they couldn't pay. And this is kind of a, 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 this is kind of a loss on us because we have social systems that protect us, that, that, that can support us in different ways. And so we have the ability to declare bankruptcy. But for those people, if you had a debt that you could not pay, you had to go to somebody who was wealthy who could pay that debt. And the way that people would have that debt paid is they would go to them and they would sell themselves into slavery. So now them and their family are sold into slavery because there was a debt that they could not pay. And then they could work into a place of freedom. They could work themselves into a place of freedom to have that debt paid off. Now just think about that of being justified, being made right. We have this missing the mark, this falling short of the glory of God, this what happens to us just like the disciples when, when the storms come or they say, don't you care, God? Don't you care that this is happening to me? And in that... The Apostle Paul writes, we have been justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him we have obtained access by faith into the grace in which we stand. So the verdict for us of being justified comes before the performance of being peacemakers. 
what is declared over us in Christ is that we are at peace with God right now, not because of who we are or what we've done, because we will always miss the mark, but we are justified by putting our faith and confidence in Jesus alone. This is what Tim Keller says in his book, The Freedom of Self-Forgetfulness. And this idea of self-forgetfulness, I want you to just ring in your head because it's really, really important if we're to be people who are peacemakers. He says this, Do you realize that it's only in the gospel of Jesus Christ that you get the verdict before the performance? So I'm going to just stop for a moment. The verdict before the performance is to be peacemakers is to be children of God. It's what it looks like to be children of God. It's not we try to be peacemakers to prove ourselves worthy of being children of God. It is the fruit of being children of God. The atheists might say that they get their self-image from being a good person. They are a good person and they hope that eventually they will get a verdict that confirms that they are a good person. Performance leads to the verdict. For the Buddhist, too, performance leads to the verdict. If you are a Muslim, performance leads to the ver- verdict. All this means that every day you are in the courtroom. Every day you are on trial. This is the problem. But Paul is saying that in Christianity, the verdict leads to the performance. It's we've been justified by faith. And then we stand in grace. It's not based on performance because salvation is not based on performance. So we're not having to try to work up being peacemakers today. God is saying what it means to be peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers for they will be called children of God. This is what it looks like to be a part of a different kingdom and look differently in the world. And so we have to understand the part of putting our faith in Christ, but he goes on later in a letter in Romans 6 and he says, do you not know that all of us have been baptized into Christ Jesus? We're baptized into his death. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. It's one thing to be dead, but this is dead and buried. Like you're, you know, sometimes when people are at the end of their life, you're not sure if they've taken their last breath or not, but this is not just dead. This is dead and buried. He's describing those who have been transformed by Christ And he says, you have been dead. You have been buried with Christ. And then you have been raised to new life. This is one of the reasons why we celebrate baptism the way that we do. That baptism means to soak. It means to immerse. It means to drench. Is that you are going in the water, someone who is dry, and you are coming out completely, head to toe, drenched. You're buried with him in baptism unto death. And you're raised to new life. Now here's why this is really important. Don't miss this is that if you're here and you're just searching and you're seeking, you're asking questions about faith, you're asking what it means to follow Jesus. We just want you to know, to be a peacemaker, to be merciful, to be all the things that Priscilla read over us from the the Beatitudes, it is impossible unless you've been transformed and made new by Christ. Don't even try. This is not about just adding good moral deeds to your life. It will never, ever be enough. You will live forever in the courtroom of life, holding out for that verdict. The only way that we have hope to be peacemakers is that we have been transformed by the Prince of Peace. That he rules over our heart and mind. In fact, that's what it says at the end of Philippians when it talks about not being anxious. Again, we see the non-anxious Jesus asleep in the middle of the boat. It says, do not be anxious about anything, but by prayer and petition with thanksgiving to submit your requests to God. So you're in the middle of the storm. You're in the middle of things, that, but don't be anxious and let the peace of God that's beyond all understanding, guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. The the Prince of Peace reigning over your mind. It's the only way to bring peace. But the second thing is for the people here who, you're in Christ, you're a disciple of Jesus. You need to be reminded today that you haven't just been buried with Christ and raised to new life one time when you made a profession of faith, when you surrendered to him. This death and resurrection happens over and over and over again in our lives. Every time we find ourselves pressed in a way, every time we find ourselves being stretched the way the disciples were and wanting to cry out, God, don't you care about me? It's an opportunity to die to ourselves and to find life, to find newness of life in him. This was explained to me by a a guy named Paul Miller. He wrote a book called J-Curve, and he talks about how we 
we're always dying and rising with Christ. So he, he gives kind of the, the, the picture of a J. And in the book, he tells a story because he's a speaker, uh, you know, a, a teacher. And he says, there's a moment where he's just asking the Lord, just, would you just reveal yourself to me in this new way? He just knew that his heart needed to be kind of turned back to God. And, and he said, he's sitting there and the, um, the speaker started to reference, he was at a conference and the speaker started reference uh, a, a graphic that he had used in his teaching that he had come up with. And he was like, oh, this is a moment. I'm going to get, like, I'm going to be able to boast. These people are going to see me. They're going to they're gonna hear me. And he goes on and he, and he begins to say, I don't know, the speaker begins to say, I don't know uh, even who came up with this exactly. And then he says, I think it might be, and he mentions some guy. There was some guy that was, had been taking credit for his work that was not his work. And he said, he just kind of chuckled because he realized, I just cried out to wanting the gospel revealed to me, wanting the truth, wanting to be humbled. And yet even in that little moment, there was a desire for boasting and the Lord inviting him, invited him into a moment of death, of not being seen, <laughs> of having to be humbled and then be able to, 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 to raise in life of knowing the verdict that was over his life, which was that he stands in grace because of what Jesus has done for him. It's not about what other people are saying. And you realize when we think about other people's words and we're going to end with some of these reminders on the Sermon on the Mount, I mean, it's one thing to be slandered, to have people say wrong things about us, but even just being misunderstood is kind of a, a mini death for us. And so the Lord invites us into this journey of self-forgetfulness. What Tim Keller called in that book, it's a little book, I would encourage you to get it and read it. It's like a, just a one or two hour read. The freedom of self-forgetfulness. If we want to be peacemakers, we have to be people, we have to be people who are not thinking about ourselves. Peacemakers are not motivated by self. How do I look? How am I received? How do people relate to me? How is this affected? How does this affect me? Peacemakers are not touchy or defensive or argumentative. But we know that this is often how we are, and so we have to have in view the Prince of Peace. We have to have in view the right view of ourselves who are those in need of peace so that we can take those two truths and then we can move into a broken world and we can be peacemakers. See, for my kids, and I'm reminded every time they're sick, they have this desire in them that wants their truth to be heard. <laughs> like, I'm not feeling well, and this is what I think will make me better. But oftentimes the thing that they think makes them better will actually just drive them further into sickness. And so to be peacemakers, not people who just keep this peace, who just kind of say whatever. And I'm just saying that because it was, and I, I realized of all, the, of all the pains, of all the people dealing with, with, with uh, you know, terminal illness with wars that are going on that kids in a normal sickness in a first world country where you have everything available to it is a very, very small storm. But even that very small storm can bring out, can bring out flesh in us. And that reminder, I just want to keep the peace. I just want to say this thing in the moment that'll just make it feel better. And Jesus calls us not to just keep the peace, but to be peacemakers. And peacemakers are truth tellers. Peacemakers are truth tellers. We, we tell the truth about God. We tell the truth about ourselves. And we tell the truth to others. And this is not truth telling for the sake of truth telling. It's not truth telling for the sake of winning an argument. It's truth telling for the sake of love. It's because I love, I'm going to speak the truth in love. In fact, that's what we just talked about last week as a church is that Ephesians 4 talks about the body of Christ being built up as each one are speaking the truth to each other in love. Peacemakers are truth tellers. We move into a world that is broken and we bring shalom. We bring the peace of God by living out the truth. Now, I want to just keep that in mind as we just go through just a few passages of the Sermon on the Mount. And I'm doing this to kind of, I'm doing this so that you will be stirred to think of Jesus, the truth teller, who in his teaching just comes and at each moment brings life. And you can go back and read Matthew five through seven, because every, and, and, and this is what's going to happen is the Holy Spirit is going to let things come alive in your heart to say, this is what I needed. But here's just a few things that Jesus says as he's bringing this different kingdom. Matthew five, 
Verse 27, he says, You have heard it was said, you shall not commit adultery, but I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has committed adultery with her in his heart. So God established that a way that people would live rightly, that's part of the Ten Commandments, is not commit adultery. This, your spouse is your spouse. Somebody else's spouse is not your spouse. And, he, and Jesus gives this whole sexual ethic of the way we're to live. And then we think of a world that we live in that is rampant with pornography. We have, we've just had the, the, greatest, the, the, the greatest joys in our church of seeing people delivered from the bondage of pornography, men and women, and groups that get together and pray for each other, encourage each other. In fact, what Rachel said about thoughts of darkness and about bringing them to light and what happens when we bring those things to light. But think about it, what Jesus is saying. He's bringing peace by speaking truth. And he's saying it's not just about protecting marriages and not committing adultery. It's about not even looking lustfully. So what happens in pornography? A whole industry is, a whole industry is, you know, is making, is distorting the view of something that God made beautiful. And it actually messes with your mind. It rewires your mind. It, it has great cost, great effect. And so Jesus speaks into that chaos. He brings, the peacemaker brings peace. And he calls us, calls us to bring peace and says, you need to guard even the thoughts that you are thinking about. He says, you have heard it said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Again, that says, you, you've, you've lived in a way where it's, it's love your neighbor, but hate your enemy. And Jesus says, that's not the way of the kingdom that I have. In my kingdom, you love your enemy and you pray for them. Oftentimes, the way love is talked about in our culture is love that is very restricted. It has boundaries. It has limits. It has exception. But the love that Jesus invites us to is a love that is filled with faith. It is filled with risk. It costs us. He says you're to love even your enemies. He says, you have heard it said, you shall not murder. Just think of Rachel's story and her boldness. Thank you, Rachel, for sharing that with us. We think of murder, and she was talking about suicidal thoughts. I mean, murder, taking the life of someone, we can think is the ultimate not, you know, is the ultimate anti-shalom, anti-peace. Taking your own life, you think of what has to happen, and we know that it's, we know that it's rampant in our culture. We know that it, we, we just hear stories all the time, and I know there are people in the room that have been affected by this. The ultimate anti-shalom, to take someone's life, to take your own life. And Jesus goes beyond that and says, you've heard it said, you shall not murder and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. And he goes on and says, so if you are offering a gift at the altar and remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there and go and be reconciled. So it's not just the absence of shalom is in murder, but it's in contention in a relationship. And he says, when you're offering your gift, you stop and you go and be reconciled with your brother or sister. And so as we close our time together, I want you to just think for a moment of what it looks like for the Prince of Peace to reign over your heart and mind. What it looks like to be the kind of person who, like the disciples, when something in life is pressing on you to say, God, why is it that it, this is happening? Why is it that it is this way? And Jesus comes in and brings peace to the storm that you are, you get the verdict and then from the verdict, you get the call to be peacemakers. That's what it means to be peacemakers. But I want you to think about what, what does it look like if we're the kind of people who guard even what we think about and the way we see people, who don't just love the people who love us, but we love the people who have hurt us and we pray blessing on them who don't just not take someone else's life, but even guard every single relationship so much so that when we're going to offer a gift to the Lord, when we're going to offer, and maybe even that's you today, that this Easter time before we stand and we sing together, before I sing out loud something that is declaring the truth of who God is, I'm going to go and be reconciled with this person with a relationship that is broken. That is what it means to bring shalom. It's what it means to be peacemakers. And we'll only do this when we have gone through this place of humility when we go to this place of being self-forgetful because we know what it means to be rescued. 
And so we're going to go to the table of the Lord together. And if you, if you didn't get the communion elements, if you could grab those. And this is the final thing that we're going to do together. And we're going to stand and sing a great hymn of the church. Adam, I'm going to get you to come and pray um, at the very end after I lead people in this time. You know, Jesus speaking peace, preaching peace to those who are far off and those who are near is just such an encouraging thing because he meets us exactly where we are. And if you're not in Christ today, if you're actually in the courtroom of life just trying and striving and wanting the verdict to be a good person, and it's just like that arrow that doesn't even, it doesn't just miss it by a few rungs, it just doesn't even, it just falls short of the glory of God. It falls short of who God is. And we would just say as we take these elements, this is a family gathering, and we don't want you to take these things just as, we just want you, don't want you to go through some religious ritual because it doesn't mean anything. We want you to take it in celebration. And so the invitation, I would just want to give you this invitation. You don't need me. You don't need me to put my hand on you. You don't need me. I will, I will lead you in a moment in a prayer, but you don't even need my words. <laughs> you just need to cry out to Jesus. And what the disciples were doing in that moment of their life being upended, of thinking that they were at the end of themselves, was to cry out to Jesus. And Jesus spoke peace. He spoke shalom. He spoke peace to the storm. And so as we pray, I want to give you a moment to just pray that cry out to, that crying out to Jesus. And then as the family of God, we're going to take communion together. And if, you're, if you've made that prayer, then you've been born again. You've been made new. Then you can celebrate with us. If you haven't and you're here, you're asking questions, you're seeking, then we want you to keep pursuing. And God will reveal himself to you. We trust that. Let's take a moment and bow our heads. And just for those who are in Christ today and you've been made right by him, you've been justified by faith in Jesus, not in your own works, just take a moment to reflect on that. Just take a moment to say thanks. This is a time of giving thanks. If you're here and you're just far away from God and he has, you just know that he has spoken to you. He has dropped in on your life the way that he did for Jonathan and the way he did for Rachel and these different stories. And you know that he is speaking to you now. I just invite you to pray this with me. Just say, Jesus, I acknowledge that I am a sinner who has continually fallen short of the glory, of your glory. Save me and rescue me by your grace. I confess that you died on the cross for my sins and that you were raised to newness of life to give me that life. I want and need that life. And so, Lord, we all together today just say for every place that we have been like the disciples and crying out and saying, don't you care about us? In any way in which we have looked to other things to save us, we just confess that to you now. And we just say you alone can save. And we celebrate that now together. We're going to celebrate the freedom that Jesus gives. On the night he was betrayed, he took, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. You may take the bread. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me, for as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's drink together. Lord, we thank you 
for this new covenant. We thank you that we are in you forever. And we rejoice in you. Let's stand together. I'm going to have Adam just pray for us. Um, the prayer team is going to come. And uh, you've already heard moments of prayer that have happened at different times in our service. But they're going to be around the sanctuary. And they're going to be up here at the front. You might even want to come and kneel. But I want to have Adam just encourage us and lead us in this time as we sing this great hymn of the church. Father, we thank you for this morning and what we as your people celebrate week in and week out. But today, God, we especially remember and celebrate the risen King. And so beautifully, God, you orchestrated physical, tangible pictures for us this morning and the testimony and through your word. God, of you taking what the enemy meant for death and raising it to life and what the enemy meant for blindness and giving sight. Lord, I thank you that even in both those stories, there was a process and there was a time and it's because you, Jesus, knew specifically Rachel and specifically Jonathan and you specifically know each of us and so, God, as we come before you this morning with our story, Lord, that you're writing in our life and in our mountaintop or our valley that we are walking on right now, Lord, as we surrender our lives to you and trust you with our story, God, would you rise up inside of us faith, faith to step towards each other, faith to step towards you and believe for healing today and tomorrow and for the future, God, physically, but Lord, even more so the beauty, God, of you raising us from death to life spiritually and opening the eyes of our hearts, the blind areas of our life, God, and giving sight to those places, God, the greater salvation of our souls. So God, I pray that you would do a miraculous work this morning. Father, in your people, I pray that you would empower the prayer time this morning, God. Would you inhabit the praises of your people and stir up faith in this building this morning? In Jesus' name, amen. An amazing grace, how sweet the sound. That saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. It was grace that taught my heart. To feel and grace my fears relieve. How precious did that grace appear the hour I first believed. My chains are gone, and I've been set free. God, my Savior, has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace, and the Lord has promised
God, my Savior, has ransomed me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace. Oh, the earth shall soon of like snow the sun forbear to shine but God who called me here below will be forever mine oh will be forever God, my Savior, has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing grace, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending As we uh, close our time, the ministry is going to continue, and so you might still need prayer. We'd love for you to go get prayer. Um, for Jonathan and Rachel, if you guys could hang kind of a little bit close up here, there might be people that want to pray specifically with you after they heard your story. Um, and so we just, want, we just want to know that even though as we close this time with a blessing, the ministry is going to continue. And we're going to do this again next week. So if you've just been joining us, we just want to invite you back next week. We'd love to be with you again in worship. And we're going to have a lunch afterwards for those who are, have been new to the church the last few weeks or months. Uh, I want to pray this blessing over you. And it ends with the word peace. It ends with the word shalom. And uh, so you've heard me pray it many times if you've been here. But I want you to just hear it through the... the 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 lens of God bringing not just the absence of conflict, but bringing the fullness of life and this call that we have as the people of God to represent him in the world. And so this blessing is prayed over you so that you go out from this place and that you look like him and that you act like him and that you are peacemakers. And it declares to the world that you're children of God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his shalom, his peace. Go in peace today. You're loved.